The Misty Treasury. Chapter One. Live Cargo. A wild ringing neigh shrilled up from the hold of the Spanish galleon. It was not the cry of an animal in hunger. It was a terrifying bugle, an alarm call. The captain of the Santa Cristo strode the poop deck. Curse be that stallion, he muttered under his breath as he stomped back and forth, back and forth. Suddenly he stopped short. The wind, it was dying with the sun. It was spilling out of the sails, causing them to quiver and shake. He could feel his flesh creep with the sails. Without wind, he would not get to Panama. And if he did not get there, and get there soon, he was headed for trouble. The Murroponi to be delivered to the Viceroy of Peru could not be kept alive much longer. Their hay had grown musty, the water casks were almost empty, and now this sudden calm, this heavy warning of a storm. He plucked nervously at his rusty black beard as if that would help him think. We lie in the latitude of white squalls, he said, a look of vexation on his face. When the wind does strike, it will strike with fury. His steps quickened. We must shorten sail, he made up his mind. Cupping his hands to his mouth, he bellowed orders. Furl the top gallant sail. Furl the coursers and the main topsail. Shorten the top fore topsail. The ship burst into action. From forward and aft, all hands came running. They fell to work furiously, carrying out orders. The captain's eyes were fixed on his men, but his thoughts raced ahead to the rich land where he was bound. In his mind's eye, he could see the mule train coming to meet him when he reached land. He could see it snaking its way along the gold road from Panama to the seaport of Portobello. He could almost feel the smooth, hard gold in the packs on the donkey's backs. His eyes narrowed greedily. Gold, he mumbled. Think of trading 20 ponies for their weight in gold. He clasped his hands behind him and resumed his pacing and muttering. The Viceroy of Peru sets great store by the ponies, and well he may. Without the ponies to work the mines, there will be no more gold. Then he clenched his fists. We must keep the ponies alive. His thoughts were brought up sharply, the shrill hoarse call. Again it filled the air about him with a wild ring. His beady eyes darted to the lookout man in the crow's nest, then to the men on deck. He saw fear spread among the crew. Meanwhile, in the dark hold of the ship, a small bay stallion was pawing the floor of his stall. His iron shoes with their sharp rims and turned down heels threw a shower of sparks, and he felt strong charges of electricity. His nostrils flared. The moisture in the air, the charges of electricity, these were storm warnings, things he knew. Some inner urge told him he must get his hairs to high ground before the storm broke. He tried to escape, charging against the chessboard of the stall again and again. He threw his head back and bugled. From stalls beside him and from stalls opposite of him, 19 heads with small pointed ears peered out. 19 pairs of brown eyes whited. 19 young mares caught his anxiety. They too tried to escape rearing and plunging, rearing and plunging. But presently, the animals were no longer hurling themselves. They were being hurled. The ship was pitching and tossing to the rising swell of the sea, flinging the ponies forward against their chessboards, backward against the ship's sides. A cold wind spiraled down the hatch. It whistled and screamed above the rough voice of the captain. It gave way only to the deep plump plump of the thunder. The sea became a wildcat now, and the galleon her prey. She stalked the ship and drove her off course. She slapped at her, rolling her victim from side to side. She knocked the spars out of her and used them to ram holes in her side. She clawed the rudder from its stern post and threw it into the sea. She cracked the ship's ribs as if they were brittle bones. Then she hissed and spat through the seams. The pressure of the sea swept everything before it. Huge baskets filled with gravel for ballast plummeted down the passageway between the ponies, breaking up the stalls as they went by. Suddenly the galleon shuddered. From bow to stern came the endless rasping sound. The ship had struck a shoal, and with it a ripping and crashing of timber 
the hull cracked open. In that split second, the captain, his men, and his light cargo were washed into the boiling foam. The wildcat sea yawned. She swallowed the men. Only the captain and 15 ponies managed to come up again. The captain bobbed alongside the stallion and made a wild grasp for his tail, but a great wave swept him out of reach. The stallion Ned encouragement to his mares who were struggling to keep afloat, fighting the wreckage and the sea. For long minutes they thrashed about helplessly, and just when their strength was nearly spent, the storm died as suddenly as it had risen. The wind calmed. The sea was no longer a wildcat. She became a kitten, fawning and lapping about the pony's legs. Neither hooves touched land. They were able to stand. They were scrambling up the beak to Ashitaid Beak, a long sandy island which shelters the tidewater country of Virginia and Maryland. They were far away from the mines of Peru.